Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you so much for joining uh, this WIN seminar series. Uh, I would like to first uh, acknowledge uh, that the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology, uh, located at the University of Waterloo, uh, much of our work takes place in the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main University of Waterloo campus is situated at the Haldimand Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. We have uh, today, this morning, uh, Dr. Lin Chen from the uh, Canadian Life Source uh, CLS. Uh, we are so happy that he could uh, join us. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nin Chen obtained his PhD in 2002 at the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of Saskatchewan and worked as a postdoctoral fellow at CLS between 2001 and 2003. He became a staff scientist in CLS uh, in 2003. Currently, he's a senior staff scientist at Beamline, responsible for the hard X-ray microanalysis Beamline, HXMA, in CLS. And uh, he will talk about uh, how CLS, uh, things are happening with CLS and how, when, and our Waterloo community can engage meaningfully with the CLS. Uh, good, mo uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for thank you very much for coming to this event. So it's my pleasure, it's my honor yeah, to share with my limited knowledge of exact and to you, uh, to the researcher at uh, Waterloo. So today we are going to talking about focus on because there's a multiple knowledge available at CLS. I'm going to talk. I'm going to focus on X-ray absorption spectroscopy, especially uh, I will because a synchrotron is a, everybody know that synchrotron is a very strong experimental approach. The the things that the the through my uh, semi, uh, seminar or talk, I would like to focus on more uh, like uh, how theory. Uh, to involve to the exam, and in that way we can use the full power of exam. And then this, because exam is short range ordering uh, vision, so we are going to focus focus on molecular scale. And then we are going to see that how exam uh, with the help from the theory modeling, and then to solve the problem in a molecular scale approach. So at first, I would like to thank you. Uh, I would like to thank you, Professor uh, Professor. To have me to, to come here and then here right now, let me change the status. My point, oh, what is that? Yeah, and then uh, I would like to thank the Professor Mitra, have me, and also thanks, Miss uh, McKesson, uh, for the appointment. So thanks, Miss uh, Jack. Pograd Jack, uh, for the introduction. So right now, all of you is and all uh, all the user researcher from uh, Waterloo is you are here. Help me to across this fan to uh, to come to the beautiful, uh, wonderful campus of Waterloo. This is my first. Uh, this is my second visit to Waterloo. The very first one is 2015 in May. So I'm flattered and I'm honored to be there to introduce my beamline to introduce my uh, my. Uh, Introduce Hexma and also Exav. This is my pleasure. And the second time I visit uh, uh, Waterloo in the future, I hope that I can work more closely with the faculty or research over there. And then also thank you for the Waterloo. And especially I would like to thank to my user because CLS and my beam and Hexma actually we exist because of users. Without user, any user facility doesn't have any exist significance to exist. So I'd like to thank all of users, including lots of users from Waterloo to come to Hexma to run to bring in your wonderful sign uh, to the Hexma so we uh, so we can work together. Also, I would like to thank to, uh, thanks to the funding agency, uh, 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 NSERC and CFI and UFS so they can put the tool in here and then the Hexma can exist and then we can work on wonderful exam. So, uh, so, so because when, uh, I'm, so my talk will be hexman based. That's related to my beam line. But the problem will be, so there will be the things will be more or less general. So it's uh, at hexma we try to provide solution or help to uh, our researcher or user solve the problem. What we have, what you expect at hexman is we think that at one hand we are supposed <clears throat> we should provide a powerful. Uh, machine or approach, experimental approach to, to solve the problem. 
uh, so it's inevitable pro provide a tool. But what I'm thinking is more and more with uh, as a beam line scientist, I think it's simultaneously it is, is equivalent important to share our limited knowledge or brain with our users. So in that way, two trays and Hexma merge together. We use a theory and then we work, we work together with users to solve the problem. So uh, at first, let's look at uh, talking a little bit about this tool I mean, the exam or synchrotron. So this is the overall general components of any synchrotron. So any synchrotron start with a gun. Then, so a so-called light source is uh, actually generated by the source. Here is electron beam. So that's our source of the source. So electron generated by E gun. And then the first stage acceleration, acceleration through linear, linear, and then delivered to the storage ring. Within the storage ring, electron is continually accelerated until reaching its spec energy. At CLS, we have 2.9. If you go to APS, if you go to spring eight, it's eight. So different beam, uh, different facility, they have different specific uh, specified or spec for the energy level. At CLS is 2.9. After electron and CLS accelerate, accelerated to 2.9 GeV of the energy and then delivered to the storage ring waiting for use. So if you look at the structure of the storage ring, you will see lots of step type structure. You see the step type structure anywhere from there and from any step extended out is actually so basic principle of the light source is we based on the very simple high school physics we always always think that a synchrotron the principle is high school physics but basically technology te technically is very high profile so what we have here is a magnet uh, it's a magnet and then electron beam goes through this magnet and then electron when it's moving has its unique property is whenever electron is accelerated, either changing direction or changing the velocity or rate or speed, and then electron will generate X-ray. So that's what happened. That's what is happened at synchrotron. We use a magnet bending the electron beam, making the electron circle within the storage ring. And then at the point when the electron changes direction by the bending magnet, and then we generate X-ray. Because of this concept, at synchrotron, you have two types of the beam line. Say, for example, my beam line is hexma, and my, my neighboring beam line is XSRB, also is an absorption X-ray beam line. So what's the difference between this beam line, these two beam lines? So the thing is, so for the bending magnet beam line, that's the one type. They're using this bending magnet. So one, one uh, so this bending magnet has two, two purposes here. One is control the electro beam, makes a circle within the storage ring. The second purpose turn into a light source that turn into a bending magnet beam line. So we know that, so in this way, we know that whenever electron changing the direction, generate X-ray, what if, if we make the electron changing direction in a very short distance? In that way, we can wiggle the electron many times and generate X-ray many times. So that generate, uh, that as another type of beam line. ID beam insertion device. So Hexma is an insertion device within one meter of the distance, the straight distance, and then we make the electron wiggle six days, three times. In that way, we have two magnitude difference in terms of X-ray flux. So that will be more powerful, more, more brilliant. So that's the beam line. So that's where the X-ray come from. So let's talk about Hexma. You see, this is a CLS a kind of propaganda kind of poster. And then exactly, this is the very first one, and then the position exactly at my beam line, hexma. So at that point, electron was wiggled, is wiggled by 63 times, and then the photo, the, the actual photon generated from here, follow this line, follow the beam line. So at this point, this section is from N. So when the electron come into a beam line, this section is a beam line. A beam line has a three components, POE, preliminary optical hutch or enclosure, and then SOE, secondary, secondary optical enclosure or, or hatch. And then we have third component where user sitting there, control the beam line, collect the data. In POE, so we have optics. So within the POE, X-ray is selected, is controlled, is mingled, or is uh, delivered. So that all happened inside this POE. So the critical components, most important components inside the POE is monochromic. Again, follow high school physics, 
the Bragg equation. So by scanning the crystal angle, we select energy, we scan the energy. So this picture was taken inside the hexma. So this is a photo, uh, this is the monochromator. We have Kuzu monochromator from Japan. So within this uh, monochromator, we see the two pairs of crystal. This is a typical double crystal monochromator. So the first crystal here is either silicon number one or two to zero. And then we scan the angle, we scan the energy, we scan the energy. Uh, so, and then we, we uh, so we, so the x-ray from left to right, see the crystal, and then we scan the energy, we select energy. Uh, we scan the angle, we select energy. And then the x-ray bumping up, see the second crystal. The second crystal deliver parallelly the beam to SOE. So within the SOE, the x-ray will interact with our sample in different way. So either absorption or scattering, reflecting, or if we run powder, that's a powder diffraction. And then, or we continue the x-ray to a very small spot, and then we do micro probe. So in that way, we, uh, by this kind of different mechanism of the interaction between x-ray versus your sample, re you recorded the information from the sample, either chemically or structurally. And then, so because of this kind of a different interaction between x-ray versus sample, you, ha you have different type of beam line. For example, hexma. Hexma is the very first hard X-ray beam line in Canada. So in that way, we try to do everything. So we have absorption, we have scattering, inflecting, uh, reflecting to the surface, uh, surface structure or surface chemistry, or uh, and we do the high pressure powder diffraction, ion diamond cell, so actually, so sample under extreme condition, uh, and we do macro probe. So we start operational 2005. But with the time going, other beamlines come in more specifically on a specific branch of the interaction of the X-ray versus sample. And then, so right now we have broadcast uh, operation for the scattering uh, specific. In this way, these two portions moved over there. And then we have a bio XAS coming at the new beamline. And one of the major role of that beamline is microprobe. So we shut down. So we shut down all of these. And then from now on, Hexma is going to focus on absorption, X-ray absorption, and X-ray absorption base joined with other technology. For example, also, we are going to still keep some capability of the powder diffraction, but that powder diffraction is different. The powder diffraction, we are going to have, you are going to use at broadcast speed line. In the broadcast, you do the refinement, you get a fine structure. In the future, in the hexma, we still keep powder diffraction, but will be in situ measurement in step with exhaust, and then that will be for the speciation. For example, you look at a specific 2D angle or two uh, uh, diffraction peak, something like that. Anyway, so that's overall, overall interaction, overall general kind of uh, in, uh, information regarding a synchrotron, synchrotron one -on -one. Next thing is we, we, have, we have talking about, so, X, uh, so the synchrotron is from the both side, especially for the exhaust. From my hand, it is very powerful experimental approach. So it's, it's powerful in terms of brilliance. So I can be a spec, a three spectrum from here, all collected from synchrotron. So, and then, so people are talking about, we are talking about using the lab for, for doing exhaust. Yes, that's possible, but the data collection efficiency will be low because of brilliance. So the purpose we use synchrotron all because it's brilliant as an experimental approach. Say if you use a light source to it will get the quality of the exhaust, like the blue line, that will be weeks of weeks of data collection, even go to months of months, very long time because of brilliance. So what's the difference between these two? So this three spectrum here, the blue line is from the second generation beam line. That's about Kevin number one. Right now it's shut down already. You see that the, the data quality is good enough beyond 10, it's good enough, but we do have a noise here. And then the red line come from hexma, and then the black line come from a bending magnet beam line at APS, PNC. So if you look at the spectrum here, if you look at the resolution, so the major comparison between blue versus black and red is in terms of signal noise. But if you, you want to compare between black versus red, you'll see that there are certain difference in terms of resolution, right? It, this is double peak, well-reserved, but here it's not well-reserved. This peak intensity is much strong at Hexma. So APS is much powerful in terms of synchrotron, but Hexma is insertion device. So insertion device, as I have mentioned, we have 63 pole of the magnet. 
So in that way, so in that way, so uh, in terms of flux, Hexma is stronger than the bending magnet at CLS. Of course, if at go to CLS, go to APS, if you go to a single, if you go to ID beam, beam line, that will be much stronger. So it's comparison. So this is the kind of comparison. So that's a brilliant because it's a high brilliance by using the synchrotron exhaust. So you can have a very high efficiency. You can have high resolution. You can do the in situ and dynamic study and some certain kind of speciation or investigation or research. You have to use the synchrotron. For example, those material is amorphous or polycrystalline. Uh, what's the difference between XRB and XRB? XRB, what XRB is, XRB is element specific local structure probing. That's a structure probe. That's a structure approach. But we already have XRB. Why we still need XRB? Both of XRB and XRB actually is necessary. I try to use this slide to address. So this is on, on, the, on the left here, it's a synchrotron XRB data powder diffraction. You see here, there's a ring and then you have very high resolution and a very good signal noise. And on the right here is an in situ study for the exam. So what's the difference in terms of resolution? That's different come from the way XRB versus XR to look at the material. Because I specifically mentioned XRB XR because this is a two major technology you're going to use for characterize the material in synchrotron. So what's the way, so, so, so the different resolution from these two technologies come from the way they're looking at the system differently. They emphasize different sides of story. Say, for example, if we have a school bus here, what's the way XRD look at this school bus? They are going to forget here is a boy or here is a boy, here is a girl, whether they are smiling or not, what the color of t-shirt, whether this, this boy have an intention to adjust the interatomic distance between the girl and to, do, to make the communication. They, XRD, try to ignore this local type, low concentration type of local structure environment or candy. What XRD look at this structure is, there's a symmetry line here, two-fold rotation axis, there's a symmetry mirror here. Whenever these symmetry elements is defined, and then the XRD try to move all the mass to the center of the symmetry. So in that way, the XRD view for this school bus is like this, mirror, line, and then, be, and then operated by, the, by this symmetry line and this mirror, there's a dot in between, located at the center of this seat. That's, X, that's a way. So the purpose of XRD is look at overall average structure. So in this way, intentionally to get this overall average things correct, intentionally ignore some, some details here. But X, for the, what exactly is, look at this detail. You see, there's a black things here, bigger. This is the green things is smaller. And then try to, local, try to look at what, which size is occupied and what's the impact when this occupation, uh, with, with, when this occupation take place. So look at the local structure environment, which elements there, occupied which size. So XRD and XR, we're working together, provide a complete view of the material. But so, so in that way, we can use XR to look at this kind of local structure environment. But XR, it, but so XR have to standing on the shoulder of XRD because when we talk about the site occupancy, we also define the structure framework from XRD or PDF, whatever the, the other technology, with the size doesn't have significance. Hexma. So, uh, so the Hexma is uh, the more uh, the most important specification for Hexma is this coverage. So we cover from titanium and then beyond anything on the prepared table we can detect. This is a very important specification before you go to any detail. Now I'm going to use one slide to, 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 to talking about the principle. So exam has exam and then the extended and exam portion. There are two portions here. So they come from they try to describe different parts of the reaction in the X-ray versus the U sample. And then, so when the X-ray come in to generate photoelectron, and those photoelectrons turn into photoelectron waves, those photoelectron waves going out and then backscattered neighboring elements and then generate exact portion of the, of the spectrum. And then the exam will be recorded how the photoelectron jumping out full potential, this, uh, this wall and crossing this boundary. So basically, exact recorded the electron, elect, elect, electron process 
how the electron jumping out and how the electron travel. In this way, we get elements specific from this specific size and then the local structure environment information. That would be redox and then the coordination, bonding distance, those things. Let's share our brain. So uh, what uh, so the what you expect as hexman is you're gonna have uh, you you have the chance to do the pre uh, so what you have the user support at hexman is we have pre experiment support in terms of product development and then we have on site user support we we are part of every experiment and then we are part we can be to provide support for the both experiment including the consulting for tutorial workshop and then open house and then the model. So at Hexma, we engage with user with your stuff. So what kind of things exactly can do? We are doing the nanoscale. So we can look at the bulk sample. You see the exact have a limited kind of requirement for the sample status. We can do the crystal, we can look at the crystalline material, amorphous, solid, or liquid. We can look at this, uh, we can look at the structure at the first shell and beyond. We can look at the precursor of something nanoscale system. We can look at the size of nanoparticle. We can look at the amorphous material in terms of isomorphism and, and this. And then we can look at the coexisting mechanism of the different metallic elements come together as an alloy. We can look at the structure changing progressively. We can look at the site occupancy in terms of crystalline material. Same elements, different sites. Same element, different oxidation state at different sites. We can look at the surface, for example, surface above the, sur uh, the complex above the surface, for example, inner sphere complex above the surface. We can look at the complex, we can look at complex alignment, we can look at absorption in view, surface and surface, subsurface local structure uh, adjustment. And then we can look at embedded, cap complex embed, embedded on the surface or embedded complex based something on the surface. For example, catalyst environmental type of the issue, single atom, dimer, and trimmer. So, exhaust is capable in, in the following sense, in terms of bulk per shell, in terms of shell by shell structure for the first shell, in terms of bond by bond per shell, in terms of bond by bond chemistry and structure of the first shell, and then side by side of the first shell, and then the chemistry and uh, for, the, for the second shell. And also we can look at the element, metallic element transferring with a well-defined framework. And then we can look at the time effect. So that's overall the resolution. Because of this resolution, we have a capability on the surface, for, for example, single atom above surface embedded surface. And then we can use that to estimate the size of the nano to sub nano particles. And then this will be a, a, a gray zone or invisible, invisible for the XRD if the size is, too, is a sub nano to nano scale. Okay, so I'm going to use a one case to address shell by shell resolution. The environmental case is a very good case to address a shell by shell resolution for the, for, the, for, the, for the system. For example, right now we have a mineral system. So this mineral system is so uh, okay. So uh, when we when you go to the synchrotron, the very first the very important information you want to get is redox. So for example, you want to you you want to look at four plus versus six plus plus redox. You want to determine whether these two are coexist. What's the partition ratio between them two? And then I pick up very difficult case. So this difficult case is. So if you're looking at the relative easy case, three plus I versus two plus or whatever, those will be very easy. I pick up a difficult case here. So these four plus versus six plus corresponding to two different first shell coordination polyhedron. Four plus is like this. So, and then uh, this is uh, six plus. Uh, and then it's, uh, the more difficult thing is here, experimentally. So the edge jump of these two spectrum exactly parallel to each other. So in that way, we cannot use those common and used way in exchange is first directed to de determine the coexisting of the two oxidation shells. But we have another ways by this shoulder. So for this, uh, for this case, I will address this shoulder PTL 17189 related to the structure component. When we're talking about the structure components of the system, it can be either bound by bound, shell by shell, and so on and so forth, or side by side. So we have two oxidation states here. And then people said, if you, why, if you want to identify whether there's a six plus in this system, you're based on this shoulder piece. Let's see why. So this specific system, 
have two bird shell. There are two uranium sites here. They are, they are pseudo symmetry to each other by a pseudo symmetry plane. Uranium one and uranium two, both of them have actual have an actual here, and then they have equatorial plane. On this pseudo equatorial plane, there are, there are five oxygen. Naturally, each of the uranium sites here is coordinated. It's all very complicated. And then this is about so this is a site uranium one and uranium two. The, the oxygen here is for each size is starting from one to seven. So one, one to one, seven and two, one to two, seven. If because uranium one size and uranium two size both see the X3 at the same time. So in, the, in this way, we put them together as an excess, X axis as a bound distance. And then you see that there's a J point. The J point specifies the coordination environment jumping from the actual to equatorial. So the bound distance is dramatically changing. In that way, we try to mimic the way actually see the sequence of backscattering from this oxygen to the center of absorbing uranium and then cut it as, so at this point at R1, we just calculate the first oxygen relate uh, backscattering received by uranium one side and uranium two side. And then when we extended our calculation theoretically to R, R2, and then these two, structure of the actual is developed. And then when we begin to calculate R3, R4, and R going to R6, all of these two coordination polyhedron is developed. So let's see what the theoretical modeling tells us. So this is a so based on this we have a structure system and then we have an existing system theoretical. And then let's zoom into this peak here. You see that when we crossing the red line that's corresponding to R2. That means that the center of absorption uranium begin to see the oxygen located at the equatorial plane. And a uh, plane, you see that crossing this J point, the peak to peak distance and the relative intensity begin to converge experimental. When we go to R6, that means that all of the two oxy, uh, uranium first uh, shell co co uh, coordination is well developed. We have this peak to peak distance, peak to peak intensity well re, well reproduced experimentally. In this way, this shoulder peak indicating the growing process of this first shell coordination of the uranium size, uranium one and uranium two size. Whenever this peak is well developed, that means that the precursor of these three species is developed. That means that you have this uranium side, uranium one and uranium two size well developed in a amorphous material. There, therefore, this specific system, this peak here is a fingerprint feature of the shell structure of the first shell coordination of this specific system. We can do that for any system. All right, let's, do, let, let's look at bound by bound. This is a complicated system again. So the system I'm talking about today is most complicated one we can see in the system. So right now we have a very strong distorted first shell. There are six oxygen here. So you'll see here the shortest one corresponding to the longest one is 0 0.8, 0 0.78 angstrom. In exact, the resolution is 0 0.02 angstrom. So this is well beyond, so higher than the, so is this structure distortion is very strong. So what we are going to do right now for this spectrum is we have, this is the experimental spectrum. We try to address each peak here to the structure components of the shell first shell coordination. That's corresponding to O1, O2, O6. Let's see how we do it. Start with the shortest one, that's O1. So, and then everything else in the structure system, we keep as it is predicted by prismography, and then we're changing the O1 progressively along this fourfold rotation axis, assuming that there are certain external screws making this bond changing its bond distance. And then we generate structure system based on this structure system. And then we have existing system. And based on this theoretical existing system, we do two normalization here. The first one is normalized here. Following normal procedure in existing, we see that A peak pre-edge feature here is strongly correlated to the shortest bound O1 changing in terms of bound distance. And also by the second normalization by B and C, we see that at certain distance, this D feature even disappears. So in that way, by this, the first structure system, we address this pre-edge feature A and then the post and the feature D to the shortest bound 
in the first shell coordination. And then we do the same game for the O2, O5, until O6. Let's jump to 6 directly. And then this O6 structure system. So we have O6 makes the O6, that's the longest line in the first shell coordination in this system, make it changing the bound distance along this pseudo rotation axis in the structure system, and then get a green system. I, again, by the two normalization, we figure that this, this O1, this O6, the longest one in the first coordination is not relevant to A, feature pre-edge at first of, of pro estimation, is strongly related to B. That's, a, that's, a, that's actually B is defined edge jump for this specific system. By this kind of game, we decouple the six compo structure components, that's the bonding for the first shell O1, O2, O6, we have four features here and build up, we develop based on this direct modeling, we, de we develop this kind of correlation between exam features versus structure components with this. And then you'll see that this correlation, this trend is matching the core kind of development of the first shell coordination. So in that way, we decouple this complicated exam into three exam here, defined by the shortest one, so the, the lowest energy edge is B, and then C determine the, the C feature here corresponding to second exam related to O3, O5, and O4, and then the D corresponding to the shortest one. So in that way, the so-called so-called redux, so-called redux or oxidation state for this specific case related to the longest latin O6 of the first shell coordination. So in this way, the so-called chemical shift of exine from this is decoupled. We have a three exine. So in that way, by this kind of theoretical understanding, we can address the structure components of each peak to, uh, we can address each experimental resolved spectrum feature to the structure component. In reality, when you deal with this, if you see that a specific peak is a changing intensity or changing the position that's related to the certain part of the first shell coordination changes. So in this way, exact, in a certain case, we have bound to bind found resistance. Then let's look at the metallic element transfer. This is the interest case. Uh, so we have a catalyst. People resolve this kind of experimental feature. So we have A features, and then A features resolve it actually related to two components. One is like edge redux changing along the energy direction, and then we have A2 actually is changing relative here. You see from here, A2 is dissolved, is kind of decreasing. And then for B, we have a two feature, either the peak shifting or peak intensity changing. C, same thing, we have a changing in intensity and peak drifting. So in this way, we have a DFT calculation. So we have a structure framework. And this DFT predicted that this is a lesion, this is a battery study. And then from here, we have, a, we have lesion here. And then between the lesion, lesion uh, kind of a uh, plane embedded, we have this kind of structure. So this kind of structure here, we have three elements with a different partition ratio, nickel, manganese, and cobalt. And then here is exine spectrum. So what we have here, and then based on the pre, pre, DFT prediction, we can see that we have different configuration based on external uh, stress, certainly. And then based on this structure, based on this DFT predicted model, we can have exit calculation. You see that we reproduce a trend of A1 and A2, and we reproduce uh, the, the ex experimentally result B1 and B2 trend, and also resolve, reproduce the C1 and C2. In that way, we related to this exit absorbed progressively changing in the system related to the structure framework changing in terms of element drifting inside the framework. You see there's a different electron, there, there's different, uh, different elements, specific uh, configuration changing. So this is an element transferring within an overall uh, defined framework. All right, so time effect. Clearly uh, we see something. If we don't know what's the reason to generate that effect, we, we can say that that's a time effect. For example, the aging process, of the human being, that's a time effect. But they, that, that, can may be, that can be addressed for different reasons. Here we have a user, we have a sample. So he has a sample prepared and then keep it in a glove box for several months. And then between like before the experiment, he prepare a fresh one and then we run the experiment. And then for this experimental data, we see that that time trend because we don't know what impact that. So let's call it time trend, time effect or time trend. And then we have a trend, 
intensity in ch uh, changing, and then we have a B B trend, and then there's uh, intensity changing or kind of a resolution, and then we have C trend. So experimentally, we have this. So let's understand this, what happened in the sample system. I try to use this as a kind of example, again, as a resolution for the exhaust. So initially, we have initial, uh, initially we have an initial structure model, so provided by the crystallography. So that's a structure. So this is antimony. So we have antimony here, tetrahedron size, and then we have sulfur, we have a, uh, we have a nitro, uh, we have a, we have an A here. So basic purpose for this sample is they try to control the replacement of the sulfur by chlorine. So that's basically this system. And then what happens through these six weeks, uh, uh, several week, uh, several months sample in the glove box? So there, and then based on this, based on this initial structure model, we have two models. One model is model one. So we try to separate the time effects separately as the particle size effects and the chemical effect. The particle size effect is we assuming that this amorphous, this amorphous material have intention to grow itself without touch inside the condition under the condition of glow box. So, so we, we develop a structure system with a radius of the cluster size from three to eight. So that's a structure system with a progressive size changing in the nano to net from the sub nano to nano scale of the particle structure system. And then the second M2 will be, we progressively re replace increasing the site, the, the elements replacement of sulfur by chlorine. And there's a chlorine further in kind of site occupancy within the glow box. So the conclusion is basically, I gave the conclusion here first, is the site is a, is a crystal size effect is not chemical. M2, M1, so M1 corresponding to the cluster size. So, and then based on that, progressively increasing the nanoparticle the system, the structure system, we have existing system. And then if we zoom in from the nanoparticle up to six angstrom, we reproduce experimentally a blocked data track. So in that way, one solution provided already is the is a nanoparticle in growth. That's a, this is a structure effect regarding this time effect. So this is the one solution. And then let's look at the M, M2 structure hypothesis phase. And then we have progressively increasing without replace uh, sulfur. So it's pure sulfur and one and two, three and five replaced of the uh, sulfur by chlorine. And then if you look at the overall structure here, there are no changing, there are no significant changing beyond this, but overall the major changing is starting from here. Except B1, uh, B and C experimentally resolved, there's a very important feature show up in this structure system is B1. So dramatically drop intensity here, but this is not ex experimentally resolved from here. So the conclusion is this chemical effect is not the major effect in view of this thing changing. Basically, this material within the glob bar uh, condition, the crystal size is increasing. All right, let's look at a single atom. So a single atom is, I am using this uh, single atom gold on the L, so on, on this uh, layer double hydroxide surface. So we have a system here. So the, the substrate is nickel and uh, iron, so it's a different partitioning ratio. And then before, so this is a very good project is, so this is a in, very interesting talking about uh, OER. And then the sample system is like this. So uh, the approach the user have used it, they have finished all of other necessary characterization summarized here. So all of this uh, characterization provide certain information for the system, but this part of them, so cannot provide regarding the single atom evidence. So only one they can provide is from here, heard, heard it. Heard from her here, and then you can see the brighter single spot here, suggests there's a single atom gold based on this uh, six-fold rotation axis. But we can, based on this information, we cannot conclusively say this is single atom, and we cannot say which side is up. The, and then what, what this product strong is, they provide all of the possible possibility hypothesis guide, and then uh, uh, calculate predicted by the DSM. And then we do the calculation beforehand. We predict ex experiment results. And then when this sample come into the my beam line, first the scan finish, we know the conclusion is converged. So in that way, this is the experimental result compared to other data. So 
The black line, experimental. The red line is simulation. You'll see that A, B, C, D, even E here is reproduced. And then the, 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 the blue line is gold foil, gold, gold foil, long range ordering gold. The, ta the, the target of this product is identified single atom gold. So in that way, you, after first scan, this story is there. Anyway, so this is show you again how strong support we can get from BSD calculator. And then that will be a very, this is a good example for so single atom. Because otherwise, by other technology, we cannot identify that this gold is set, setting on the joint point between nickel and iron on this specific site as an atom. All right, so I'm running out. So uh, uh, can I back another two minutes? <laughs> All right, this is the very last case, in situ exam. So this is the manganese PAs, this is the battery, and then experimentally, we resolve, we resolve. So this is a, a so the, the figure one, one and one, two, we recorded the charging process from the beginning and the ending. We resolve alpha, alpha trend and beta trend. In, and then in the, in the, and then for the, and also we resolve create feature A and B, you see progressive pending here. So, that's, that's for the first cycle of charging. And then when we go to the discharging, this alpha trend, beta trend, beta trend, and A trend and B trend reverse. So we have forward and backward experimentally resolved trend. And also the, the two one and two two summarize the first cycle starting point and ending point of the R, uh, gamma. So this is the angle trend. And then this is four, 451 cycle. You see this is trend, the, uh, the angle getting smaller. So I'm going to skip this, skip this slide and go to the conclusion. So conclusion is we by the uh, by the existing theoretical model, we related all of this finger this feature to certain particle to certain structure within the uh, within the compound. So with this particle with this particle, the, the the compound which impact the performance of the this battery is this spinel type of the nanoparticle embedded in the system. So, and then this is a particle size. And then we have a one nano as a threshold. And then we, by the theoretical modeling, we know that alpha trend and the beta trend correlated to the, correlated to the developing and the de dissolving of the nanoparticle <laughs> with the <a> size <clears throat> diameter less than nano, less than one nano in diameter. So, and then beyond this point, the A trend and the B trend changing <clears throat> Corresponding to the structure changing, the particle size increasing and decreasing uh, with the particle size beyond half nano. And then, then whenever this angle getting converged, that means that so this nanoparticle is getting getting made as a major component of the manganese spectrum here. So in this way, we related charging, discharging, uh, of uh, related this uh, chem, uh, this chemistry process related this chemistry, chemical uh, process to developing and dissolving of this nanoparticle, the spinel type of the nanoparticle within the framework, the structure framework of the battery. So this is the project development. Uh, so may I back another half minute? So the project development at Hexma, we, we, we suggest you have a theoretical and uh, ex experimental two components here. Theoretical will be a hypothesis guided first cycle of model. Either new model provided by user by the by your, by your proposal or with by discussion or previous work or something available at the market. So basically at, he at Hexma, I have a data that cover all the proposal to Hexma since 2007. Everything mentioned in the proposal is already in my database. And also modeled, calculated, mixed in and in up. And then we can, by this step, we can identify the project specific or species developed specific fingerprint feature, exact and exact. And then guided by this, we suggest user to the to the to the feasibility study experimental part. All of my return user, every time when they come back, they, they bring over a few sample for the next project. They will try it to verify the theory and then develop experiment procedure. That's not trivial. This is very important. Of course, for the new for the new user, you've never been hackman before. We have another approach we can discuss later. And then experiment after this part, it well developed. You can write your proposal and then design your experiment. With this well developed, your your proposal is going to have a good score. And then we do the on on site experiment. That has to be guided by the feasibility study of this portion. And then we adjust and optimizing in step with the progress of the experiment. 
guided by all everything else. And then we go to total experiment. So that will be data processing, data reduction, LCF, and R space city. And then the second cycle of model. That's our roadmap. Starting from hypothesis, experiment, and go to the solution. From the hypothesis, what, who, and where is element specific information from your hypothesis and when and how in situ. So we do a lot of in situ at Hexma. And then, so what you expect at Hexma is we have a very good engagement here between science and the technology, problems identification and problem solving, and then the beamline stuff and the use that we have good engagement. We support, we participate, participate, and we collaborate. Collaborate. Come to Hexma. So, to this point, uh, I'm going to stop. Thank you so much.